Love. Love. Is a very deep. It's a very deep. Wide. Love. Subject. Subject. Just when you think you've covered it all, something new happens. Let's jump into it. So for those who are taking those, part one is today, and we're dealing with the foundation. As as in all my series, I always like to lay the foundation for the rest of the month on the very first service. Let's jump into it, son. So I'm a person of definition. I believe that even if you know the know the definition of a word, when you are seeking spiritual direction and guidance, look up the, the definition anyway, and then go to the word of God. Love is defined, one of the definitions is an intense feeling of deep affection to adore, to care very much for, and this is one also, be devoted to. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, I could use a little bit more devotion. A little bit more devotion. Um, in the scripture, and I'm going to go into 1 Corinthians in a minute, but in the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13 before I go into it, I want you to know that the word charity is used synonymously with love. So wherever you see charity in this scripture, uh, when I get to 1 Corinthians 13, charity and love is seen as the same thing. And to me, that is very profound. That the word, when you think of charity, at least when I think of charity, I think of something that's free, right? A donation is something that a person gets that they don't have to pay for. Amen? Look at him and say, there's a message right there. There's a message right there. I mean, love is something that if it's synonymous with charity, that means it is given without a person being caught up with what they're going to get back. Does that make sense? That's not to say that there's no level of expectation of getting anything back but it's something that people give whether they get something back or not. I want to lay the foundation by saying that love is much more powerful than we often realize. Because when you think about a person that's giving something away for nothing, that means that a person is not caught up in, what, in being reciprocated. They are willing to give it. And here's the thing. You do not need to be in a relationship a friendship or a kinship for that matter of any kind where it is not being reciprocated. Amen. But I'm, tr I'm what I'm trying to lay the foundation to you this morning to make you understand that love is so powerful. It will be done whether somebody's getting reciprocation or not. Are y'all hearing me? And some of y'all have your own testimonies of loving without reciprocation. Amen. Meaning that, that, that love is so powerful that if a person is giving nothing for it, they're not getting anything back, no reward. They may not even be giving acknowledgement of the fact that they're loving them. But because of the dynamic of what love is, they'll give it anyway. Look at your neighbor and say, so be very careful. So be very careful. Who you choose to love. Who you choose to love. Are y'all hearing me today? Think about when we think about giving somebody something for nothing, that what is the one thing that you hope at least that they, 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 they will at least have with them is a certain level of appreciation. Amen? Even when, even, come on now, even when, you, when somebody outside a food line asks you for that dollar. Now you're not homeless, but you're not rich. And you're hoping when you give up that dollar, they ain't gotta, you know, give you a plaque or nothing. They ain't gotta break out in a shout. But at least say thank you. Amen. That means that the appreciation is fundamental. And, and when you make when you get into a lifestyle where you are giving something as serious and powerful as love and you're not getting any appreciation, then what are you setting yourself up for? Are y'all hearing me today? OK, so. The, uh, some of the definitions for charity. It says the volu excuse me, the voluntary giving of help to those in need. Now that's heavy right there. Because charity is giving somebody help when they're in need. Oftentimes, we get into relationships because we are under the impression that that person needs us. 
in a, in a situation where a parent is raising a child, they love their children, and they're taking care of them, that, that child actually needs them. And so I want you to really realize that need is very much connected to why people choose to love and who they choose to love. It also says here, it says kindness and tolerance in judging others. Have you ever known someone that will never get on somebody's case when they need to? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, you ever know anybody in a relationship and the relationship is one-sided? Like, this person does everything, shows love and all that. That other person, child, you'll be lucky if they say hello that day, right? Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Love has a dynamic in it that even when they've identified incorrect behavior, they won't judge. And there's a degree of this word right here. Somebody say tolerance. Tolerance. Love has a high level of tolerance. Don't confuse complaining with whether or not that person is tolerant. You ever heard somebody complain all day about something? It's 10 years later. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm sick of them. Okay, that was the 80s. And you're still with them, right? Sometimes we confuse people's actions. You don't, no, no, no. You, we confuse what people say with their actions. No, child, when folks have put up with people, there's a certain level of tolerance. They may be complaining all day, but they are tolerating that. There's some folks, you, some people you look at, that's why I tell folks, you never know what's really going on between two people. And it's, a, it's, it's bad to think you do. Because there's stories and situations that run deeper than Instagram can show. <laughs> And so when we talk about why folks put up with certain stuff, sometimes you don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't contribute it to love, but love is the only reason they still there. Well, I'm trying to help somebody. We're going to walk slow. <laughs> All right. Somebody say compassion. 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 When you think of compassion, you think about a feeling of, of, of somebody showing mercy. That means when they look at somebody in a bad situation, even if that person could be judged, they reserve their judgment and show compassion for them. Show forgiveness for them. Love is powerful. And next it says, consideration. Look at your name and say, who have you been considering for a relationship? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love dictates who you consider and what you will consider dealing with. Y'all follow what I'm saying? There are no perfect people in the world, but if you decide that we're going to be together, you got to consider what it's going to look like, be like. What is it going to feel like? And so you, you examine how this person functions and acts, and you have to make a decision whether or not I'm willing to live with that. Can I help somebody? That's why you got to get past the honeymoon stage. Right. They're already, you know, they got the lipstick and hair done every time you see them. No, no. <laughs> And I know Beyonce made it popular, but they didn't wake up like that. <laughs> oh, <that's... laughs> Somebody say indulgence. indulgence. Love controls what you will choose to indulge in. When you hear people say, I ain't never did this before. <laughs> right. Love navigates the things you'll choose to do and be involved in. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the next. First Corinthians 13. It is hard to have a discussion, a biblical discussion at least, or a spiritual discussion about love without going to this scripture. First Corinthians 13 begins. It says first, uh, first Corinthians 13, one through seven and then 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. What they're saying is that sometimes church people, we get caught up in, sometimes you, a church can get caught up in the culture of what that church is like. And what I mean by that, all churches are guilty of it. You have some churches that praise a whole lot. Like they dance for 45 minutes to an hour before the word is preached. Then you have some churches, they worship for 45 minutes to an hour. You have some churches, we straight to the word. Or you have some churches where they speak in tongues heavily. You have some churches that make a lot of noise and some churches that don't. 
And sometimes we think that we confuse the culture of a particular church or ministry with whether or not this person is demonstrating God's love. And so what happens is if you go to the praising church, oh, you ain't praising God, oh, you don't really love him. Because in that environment, they have been molded to believe that unless a person knocks over four or five chairs, then when they say they love God, it ain't real. <laughs> or in another church, if they ain't got their hands up worshiping for a long period of time, or if they're not speaking in tongues, then they don't love God. Look at people and say, not so. Not so. Because let me tell you something. I done met some folks that speak in tongues and cuss. <laughs> So kill that. And I know some folks love to weep, they hold their hand in worship and can't say hello to nobody. How you speak? You can't tell me you spent an hour with God. You came out and can't be God like in your the way you behave. Then you've been somewhere, but it wasn't with Jesus. Some people are at church having emotional fits. You ain't met Jesus yet. Because when you meet him, then he's going to make you see that what's wrong about you. And when you and when you and when you go into worship, God gives you a view of others from his point of view. And so when you come out of worship, you don't see people for flaws. You see them for who God loves and you treat them as such. That's why Jesus said you will know my disciples by the way that they love. This is how deep love is. Jesus said, look, not by how many scriptures they quote, what their status is in the priesthood. The way that they love will let you know if they ever Amen. met me. Amen. Are y'all hearing me today? And so Paul is making it plain who wrote first Corinthians. He's saying, look, if I can speak in the tongues and all of that and make a lot of noise, it ain't, it ain't nothing but noise if I don't show love. Verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. Now, this is a deep statement. He's saying, look, if I can flow in prophecy where I can speak the, uh, from the mind of God, something of the past, the present or the future, or if I got the kind of faith that I could be in a jacked up situation, but uh, uh, facing a mountain, but I can believe by faith that God will remove that mountain if I pray to him, even if I have that level of spiritual maturity. If I don't have love, it's absolutely nothing. Amen. I know one of the hangups that I've always had as a pastor and a minister who've gone to different conferences and stuff is sometimes there's this. Uh, and don't get me wrong. You need to respect and honor men and women of God. Amen. It's a sacrifice to become a, 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 a recognized pastor, preacher, prophet, evangelist, minister of any kind, because th there's a certain responsibility. But I don't believe in worshiping people. And nor do I believe in folks acting like they on some grand stage somewhere. And I've been to some work, some, some, some events and the pastors and they carry around these airs, you know. And so when the praise and worship is praise and worship, like, like they act like they can only shout if they preach it. They can only praise God when their favorite, when their praise and worship is singing. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Then folks can't get into the spirit unless there's folks they're connected to, which means you ain't connected to God. And sometimes we get caught up, in, you know, in the fact that I prophesy, I walk in faith. And we think because the knowledge and I've seen people argue because they can give a message somebody quote a whole lot of scripture. But I ain't felt God yet. You quote a lot of scripture, but I don't feel his presence when you talk it. And so this is what Paul is saying that, no, no, when you're walking in love, it's deeper than the demonstration of knowledge, the acquisition of information. It's about the demonstration of his spirit. Amen. He says, and have not shared, I have nothing. Verse three. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Now, this is deep. You can feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned. Now, that's serious. I'm not doing that. Right. <laughs> but he's making a point. What he's saying is sometimes people get so caught up in deeds that they forget that how you treat people matters. Like you got some people that do a lot of great deeds. Like he's saying feeding the poor and all of that. And you know what I mean? You willing to make sacrifices to prove how much you love God. It likens me when I think about the part like willing to be burned. Right. The best the closest example visually I can give to y'all is sometimes we have folks who love who, who claim to love the Lord. But they like to create adversarial situations so they can argue about the Bible. And when folks come against them, they see the affliction that people come combating them as some kind of sacrifice to God. When really it's some beef they started, i.e. people at the belt tower yelling that you're going to hell and wonder why nobody gets saved ever. 
You can't, in other words, you got a segment of sometimes of the believer in population where we get into these biblical discussions and fight and argue about what the word really say, and you know, this, that, and the third. And it's like, man, at the end of the day, you're not demonstrating God's love. Your information is irrelevant. Does that make sense? And so it says here, even if you make these sacrifices, unless you have love, it profits nothing. Go to the next one. It says, now here's where, look at the neighbor and say, we're about to find out. We're about to find out. You actually, you actually. ever loved anyone. <laughs> Remember now, for those coming in late, charity is synonymous with love. Charity suffereth long and is kind. That means that, that love, with, how do you, rec- the, the scripture's trying to help us to recognize when love is in action. Love will deal with some nonsense. For a long time. And still find a way to be kind. Somebody like, I like them. I ain't love them. <laughs> Let's walk through it. Charity envieth not. It's a dangerous thing. And look, mind you, when I'm talking, even though we're so relationship minded, especially that the, the abundance of age group in here, it's like relationship. <laughs> right? But I'm speaking, I want y'all to know I'm speaking beyond relationships. I'm talking about friendships and even family relationships. Amen? When it says here, love envy is not, it's a it's a bad thing when we supposed to be friends and you envy me. It's even worse if we in a relationship and you're envious of me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? When we really love each other, then I'm excited for you. I celebrate with you. But if I got low self-esteem issues and you seem to be somebody and I'm comparing myself to you, then I can create beef in my mind that does not exist. And so love and so love doesn't do those types of things. It says here, charity vaunted not itself. That means getting pumped up. You know, you, you ever have somebody got to tell you everything he did for you every day? The only reason you hit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, now. Relationships go through a lot of roller coaster rides, and sometimes you do have to remind people. <laughs> so, so don't think that it's bad every time somebody makes you, like, you know, you're, you're, it's like, you know, somebody that, we've been living together for two years, you ain't had a car, none of them years. You got a car for the last two months, and now when I ask for a ride, you got you, you go all into exorcism and that. <laughs> Like, no, no, I ain't telling you you got to pay me back and drive me for 365 days time too. But y'all going can I get the food line? Without driving my car? <laughs> y'all follow what I'm saying? And so, and so, and so, uh, charity, love doesn't, doesn't vaunt itself, and nor is it puffed up, having to prove itself. See, when, when you feel like you always have to make known who you are in the relationship, that you need to question if love is really there. It says here, do if not behave itself unseemly. Do y'all know what that means? Look at David say, that's cold for ratchet. That's cold for ratchet. <laughs> behave unseemly means that you're acting real ratchet and ghetto and hood like right now. Showing up. And somebody's like, what does that mean? Buzzing tires. <laughs> Blasting people on the social media. That is acting unseemly. And then, you know, what's, what's amazing is folks will go on Facebook and, you, and, and, and blast, like, somebody they mad with. And when somebody asks, like, mind your business. <laughs> I'm getting my business. Don't get in your business. You just share it with all of us. <laughs> Unseemly is when you get to get acting ungodly. Let me tell you something. See, this is why it's dangerous to fall in love with the wrong person. It's dangerous to, to be a loving friend to somebody who never intended on being a real friend. Because they can make you act out of character. See, see, when you're in a situation where you're pushed to, to, to act unseemly, that means that you've thrown your values to the curb because somebody has frustrated you. We're going to get into why we get so upset. Also, it says, seek if not her own, is not easily provoked, think of no evil. Listen, you dealing with somebody that get, they always suspicious, you need to stay away from them because they're not healed yet. See, it says here, it's not easily provoked. When somebody can easily get mad, easily think, oh, you cheating? All I did was say hi to them. (laughs) That's all I did. But let's be real, man. You know friends can get jealous of your relationship with other friends? 
Yeah. It's real talk. Like, let's say you came from another city and you're in this city now. You made some friends, but some friends from back home come up. Sometimes the friends here act funny with those friends. Yeah. And uh, exactly. <laughs> The new friends is jealous at the time you've known the other person. And the old friends are jealous because these are your new friends. They get to see you more than they do. And sometimes they be beefing with each other. And what's worse is when the beef is not, like, open. It's this, you know, mind game thing. Like, you're getting them all together, but you're the only one excited about it. And like, yo, this is Keisha, and this is Vanessa. We all chilling. They're like, hey. <laughs> But let me not let the brothers off the hook. Sometimes guys, but see, guys, they, they, they act different. No guy's going to say, I'm jealous of your friend. No. The dap up is so weak. It's like, yo, this one. It's like, look, look. It's, up, man. it's like, what was that, man? You the king of, you know, all that. You know? And now all he gets is a finger roll. Come on. Rejoice if not in iniquity, right? Check this out. But rejoice if in the truth. That means love, iniquity is a repetition of ungodly behavior, right? And so what that means is, is that, that, that love doesn't get excited for foulness to continue. Like love doesn't look for an opportunity to bring up dirt. Some of y'all are like, oh yeah? <laughs> when you, when you, when, what they're talking about rejoicing in iniquity is like when you, now mind you now, I'm preaching to you, but I've been guilty of this as well. When you get hungry to catch somebody, you know, jacking up and being foul. You're like, yeah, see, I told you you ain't nothing. <laughs> that, at that time, that wasn't love. <laughs> love does not rejoice in somebody doing something that's wrong. And it says, um, uh, but rejoice in the truth, meaning that even if the truth is uncomfortable, they eventually are glad that it got out. Amen. See, the Bible says the truth shall make you what? And so uh, love has a way that even if it's hard to stomach, I thank God that at least now I can be free of whatever misunderstanding, misrepresentation I had of you, the situation, us or whatever. Now I know the truth and now I can move on with my conscience clear. Amen. It says bear of all things, believe of all things, hope of all things, endure of all things. And see, this is the crux of what I'm talking about. This is what makes love so dangerous. Do you notice it doesn't say bear of good things? It doesn't say believe if in just good things. Or when the situation is good. Or when the person is good. It says hope of all things. It doesn't say it's just hopes when God is in it or when the Lord has blessed it. Or when God has chosen it, endureth all things. It doesn't say it endures it because Jesus is a part of it. It says all things, which lets you know that you can love the wrong thing just as much as you can love the right thing. You can love the right one just as much as you can love the wrong one. You can love the right situation and the right circumstance just as much as you can love the wrong circumstance. And so this is why how you choose to love and, 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 and who you choose to love is so serious. Because when love is released, it, it, it's, it's hard for it to maintain boundaries because it endureth all things, even if those things are wrong. It will, it will bear with it. It'll endure it. It'll remain hopeful, even though it's clear, baby, what needs to be done. But, 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 but love, this is where we get when people say love is blind. You can look at this scripture and gather that deduction because it hopes in all things. It's going to be all right. Chow, no. <laughs> But when somebody has put love, mind you, this is deeper than relationship. We got some folks. I, me personally, had to learn the hard way that a family member I really loved, I had to discover they didn't love me. But it was after I paid too much for the friendship I thought I had, for the connection. See, the, the one of the greatest mistakes that we as human beings make is that we think people think like us. Mm. 
how can somebody have hope in all things? Because you are you are processing your hope through the idea that they're going to do what you would do in the situation. And that's why you're always in error when they choose something else, because you think you're projecting what you think they should do and what you would do and not knowing that that's you are not them and they are not you. Y'all follow what I'm saying? And so it says here, and now abideth, now this is the, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. But of all of these, charity is the greatest. It's telling you right now that faith is awesome, right? Hope is the bomb. But nothing is stronger, nothing, the greatest is love. Amen? That means because love, love can influence what you're having faith in. And love definitely influences what you're hoping for. Go to the next. Watch this. Proverbs 15 and 17 says, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred therewith. What it's saying here is better for you to be in a situation where you may not, you may only have a little, but love is there. Than to be in a situation where y'all have abundance and love is not there. Are y'all hearing me today? Now don't take this to say as long as we're, we're going to stay broke because as long as we got love. Don't twist the scriptures, right? And please don't twist my message. But what I am saying is you are deceiving yourself to make choices Based upon the fatted cow. The fatted cow is based upon the car being driven, the house they're living in, the salary that they're making. Don't let that be the foundation. It has to play a part. Let's be real. Who wants to be homeless? You know, who wants to eat oodles and noodles every day, right? So you want to make a living and be happy about that living you're making, amen? But don't think that those things can replace love. Don't, th- don't think because the car is nice, they're going to love you. Or because they clothes is good, they're going to love you. Or because they know a lot of people and have a lot of connections, that, that means that they're going to love you. Y'all, y'all follow what I'm saying? And so and it's saying here, look, you got to go through a season eating herbs. Because guess what? Even in the example, and herbs at least is giving you nutrients that you got to have. But that fat and calf, can, you can take it or leave it, honestly, when it comes to human consumption of food. And so it's better to live with what you absolutely have to have than for you to get caught up in the hype and trying to keep up with the Joneses. And we got a lot of people that are doing things and sometimes staying in stuff too long or getting into stuff from the beginning or hanging out with folks because you want to stay connected to the fatted calf knowing that ain't no love here, though. And then what happens? You learn how to be functionally dysfunctional. Like, I know they ain't being true. I know they ain't being honest. I know they don't care about me, but I'm learning. You know, you know, we get into these funny theologies and ideas and thoughts and ideologies. Of, I know growing up, see, I'm being real, more real than most preachers want to be. I remember growing up and hearing men say, look, if you're going to cheat, at least don't do it in front of her. Don't bring it home. Wow. <laughs> see, nobody going to get real in here. I'm talking about men who are going to church with saying this. Look, if you're going to do it, then you, you got to be classy about it. I want y'all to really walk through the, 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 that we're going, to, we're going to find a legitimate way to be dishonest and put a stamp of approval on it. We're going we're gonna to walk in a betrayal of trust and the violation of commitments and vows, and we're going to learn how to just, hey, deal with it. Are y'all follow what I'm saying? It's getting tight up in here tonight. <laughs> But what is hate? You can't talk about love without talking about hate. Hate is to dislike intensely or passionately have a hostility toward. Now, this is deep. And I say that because, you know, you ever heard the statement, there's a thin line between love and hate? Because they're both passionate. That's why you ever see some people arguing all the time, I can't stand them. Stop. Just go on a date and get it over with. (laughs) Y'all follow what I'm saying? But sometimes people act like they can't stand each other because a lot of times there's an attraction there. Everybody's playing dumb. <laughs> but these are not only in relationships. You ever meet two people that be like, I'll never be friends with them. But you realize they both are the same person? <laughs> you ever realize that some people who act the same don't like each other? Like, they're doing too much. I'm like, they're doing what you do. <laughs> you, 
just hate the fact that somebody like you is in the space. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm helping you today. So with all of this foundation being led, there are four aspects of love I want to cover today. Four aspects of love that help to give us a glimpse at understanding it. Mind you, this is a glimpse. My disclaimer is I am not an authority on love or I've, I've figured the whole system out now. If that was the case, there wouldn't be times when I feel like I'm in a doghouse at the house. <laughs> I told you how I'd be messing up. She banned me from certain, you know, dinnerware, saw, you know, stuff at the house and I got to sneak using stuff, get caught breaking plates. Then I hate that question. Where's that fork? Where are them forks I bought? True story. You know the pizza cutter that you have? And you know when you, when, when we finish eating all the pizza, you close the box, throw it in the trash. <laughs> so one day my wife was like, I done bought two pizza cutters. Where are the pizza cutters? Exactly. <laughs> I was getting caught up. You saved me, son. All right. Go to the next. Watch this. So we find ourselves in Genesis 15, 2 and 4, and also 22 and 2, dealing with Abram and Isaac. This is before Abram's name became Abraham. And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. What he's talking about is Abram has not had his own child yet. And in and, and those days, not having a child was a play, level of dishonor, especially not having a son. And so he's going to God saying, God, you don't, I'm following your direction. You don't told me to go to a plan I do not know. And there's a land of milk and honey and all that. But I don't have a child of my own. And he says, all I have is Eliezer. Eliezer is a very devoted and committed servant but he's not his seed. Y'all follow what I'm saying? And so he's expressing a level of frustration saying, God, you're supposed to be the God of blessing and I've been walking faithfully with you, but I'm still childless. He promises him, in the verse four, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. In other words, you will have your own seed. He promises him that he will have his own seed. Now can I back up for a minute because I just see some meat up in there. You see this whole thing of Eliezer of Damascus? Ask your neighbor. Neighbor? neighbor. Are you the promise? Are you the promise? Or are you Eliezer? Are you I'm almost a little nervous. <laughs> Eliezer is the one that's been there, that's committed, that has proven devotion a time and time again. But Abraham, when he's away from Eliezer, is telling God, Eliezer is not enough. Look at your neighbor and make sure. Say, neighbor, are you Eliezer? See, 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 what's happening is Abraham wants his own seed from his own loins. But Eliezer's done everything that his own seed could do. But, and he's unsatisfied. Now, let me help you all with this. There are times when we villainize people for not making the choices we wanted them to make, especially if that choice is us. But you can't. The, the son Abra, Abram is alluding to what later we would know would be Isaac. And here's what I had to tell you. Isaac can never be Eliezer and Eliezer can never be Isaac. And sometimes you got to tell people, look, I need to know now. Don't have me walking around like I'm Isaac. <laughs> Isaac was also the promise. He's the child God promised Abraham. Don't have me walking around like I am the promise. But when you go to talk to God, I got to overhear that. I, oh, my name ain't Isaac. I ain't your Isaac. I'm your Eliezer. I'm that devoted and committed one that you tolerated. But not accepted. <coughs> oh, I'm shot. <trying> to... <laughs> that, that wasn't even in my notes. Watch this. <laughs> Verse 22 and 2. And he said, 
Now watch this. Now God tells him, I'm going to give you your seed. I'm going to give you your own child. I'm going to give you your promise. But then guess what he tells him? Later, now this, this happens. Verse 15 is when they're having this discussion. By the time we get to verse 22, years have passed. Not only have years have passed, but not only did Abram's wife Sarah give birth to the promised child that he talked about, Isaac, but Isaac is about 17 at this point. And guess what he tells him? And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. In other words, up here, he's talking about, God, I want this promise. I want what you said you would do. But then after it comes and he spends some time with it, he tells him he got to sacrifice it. See, there comes a point in time where we got to find out where your love really lies. And see, sometimes we love the gifts God has given us more than we love God himself. And that's why we get nervous sometimes because, you know, when so-and-so get hooked up, we don't know if we're going to see them at church. Because <laughs> they had a late Saturday night. I think they don't room empty. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Sometimes you get that car that you pray for. See, this is deeper than people. Sometimes you get that car. You was you when you when you when you needed God to give you a breakthrough, child, you was catching anybody and everybody going to church. Now you got your own car. <sighs> is Joyce Meyer on? <laughs> I think Bishop Jake's come on. <laughs> Y'all follow what I'm saying? We get a little funny once the blessing comes. Sometimes when, we, when God has given us what we desire, we get so busy worshiping what God gave, we start worshiping the giver. And he tells him, you don't realize that I had no issue with providing you what you love, Abraham, but do you love it more than me? Matter of fact, I want you to meet me at the mountaintop and I want you to offer up that thing. Which brings me to this point. Go ahead. My very first point of the day. Remember I said there's four aspects of love. The first is called, somebody say sacrifice. sacrifice. You can call it being interested, liking someone, but without a sacrifice, it's definitely not love. So we can call stuff love. Like this is, you can be interested. Oh, why is it again? I don't know. <laughs> Here's the thing. You have somebody that you think love you, but you discover, you know, they just like you a whole lot. Okay, let's be more honest, because nobody wants to do that. What about you? You ever, you ever have somebody try to get you to say something? Like, yo, do you, you ever get to that point in, in the interaction, like, like, are you going to tell you to love me, you know? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how four letters change the dynamic? Y'all could be going out, been to the movies, party, but well, once somebody say, I love you. <laughs> you know, everything changes. Isn't that amazing? Y'all, everything could have been chill. But once somebody says, I love you, and you know what's horrible is that hesitation if you're the person who said it. And you look in their face and you look, I call it monkey shine. Right? Like, their, their face looks shiny. Right? <laughs> Man. What I'm saying to you is If there's no sacrifice It's not really love For it to be love A person has to sacrifice something And they have to sacrifice more than one One of the main problems Why friendships don't last sometimes And relationships don't last Because somebody came upon a sacrifice They wasn't willing to make and let me tell you something. It's easy to judge people. Sometimes we judge individuals. You know, sometimes the church sometimes get real hard on people who are separated or divorced, this and the third. And I'm going to help you understand that love is much deeper than what you can comprehend. The dynamics that take place. And you got people that are in a certain mode, in a certain period of their life, and there's certain sacrifices for whatever reason. Because see, when we talk about right or wrong, you know, and why people make the choice that make that conversation can last forever. But the bottom line is, if something is going to work, it's going to take sacrifice. That's the only way it's going to work. 
And some people come to a sacrifice they don't think they can make. And so I caution you, if you call yourself looking for a relationship, you got to know what are you willing to sacrifice before you do it. And remember what I said earlier, love endures all things. That means not every sacrifice is a sacrifice you need to make. Can I help somebody? It ain't just love requires sacrifice. So whatever needs to be sacrificed needs to be done. No, because there's some sacrifices that you're talking about that I cannot make. Are y'all hearing me today? Go to the next. Watch this. The next one is Genesis 24 and 67. And I put Isaac and Rebecca. It says in verse 67, and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebecca and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Just to give you some foundation, Isaac obviously made it through Abraham sacrificing him. <laughs> he lived. We know the famous quote, even if you've never read it, is there was a ram in the bush, right? What happens is Abraham takes him up to the mountain and as soon as he's about to sacrifice him, God calls his name twice because he's about to drill him, right? <laughs> he calls him twice and says, no, nah, there's a ram in the bush. And so what it's saying is that it was a test to see if he loved the gift more than the giver. And Abraham passed. Sometimes you have to be willing to let something go to prove you love it. Oh, just let that soak in. The things we love don't always remain close to us. Sometimes we 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 judge folks over the dynamics of whatever their friendship or relationship is, and you don't understand. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Like for instance, you know how I, I, if y'all been coming to church for a while, I may have told you that I had friends of mine that when they heard I got saved, a whole lot of them didn't believe it, of course, right? But I had some friends who I was real on the anti-Jesus tip with, then when they felt like I got saved, they felt betrayed by me, drug my name through the mud and talked about me like a dog. But now that these days, some two of those same folks I talk to on, a, on almost every other week now and laugh and joke, and they're not saved now. But we laugh and joke. And my wife was like, yeah, you know, when you, when you have somebody in your life, even if it's somebody from your past, if they don't like who you, you know, who you with, you don't like them forever, right? So my wife was like, I just, just let me let you know, I will never like them, right? I mean, that's not Jesus. She says, Jesus didn't like everybody either. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Women will make up scripture, right? <laughs> he said, thou is not like it, right? Like, but the bottom line is, that's her love for me. All she knows is these folks disrespected me. And so she like, they, they shut down, right? But what I had to tell her, and of course, even after I said what I'm about to say, it didn't change her, how she felt. <laughs> but I said, but, you know, there's things and experiences I had with them. And there's so much that we went through. And sometimes when I'm feeling like reflecting, I love to talk to them because there was a bond that was created. And ever since then, they don't they don't treat me. They don't disrespect me. They don't do nothing like that. They've gotten past that. A lot of it was due to misinformation anyway. But but the bottom line is. When you have a certain love and connection with people, it don't. And even though time, y'all may be removed by time and you may be removed by distance, but that don't change the history. That's why sometimes, folks, you ain't seen in a minute. There's this little eh, there, a little connection you sense and feel. And sometimes the folks in your life don't understand what that is. I'm like, y'all broke up four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And it's like, no, we got a little history. What kind of history? <laughs> and so the thing is, in this particular situation, Isaac done went through God almost being a sacrifice and God uh, uh, gave a ram in the bush. And then it came time where Abraham tells Isaac, you've got to carry the promise. And a part of that carrying the promise, we don't talk about this much in church, because we love to talk about the patriarchs of the gospel. We talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we don't understand that they could, the, the, the success of God's kingdom being passed down was based upon these men finding love. And I'm telling you that when we, we just did the series called Launch and Launching, it's going to take love in your, in your life to move to the next level. And, I'm, and you got to understand, this ain't just sensual, late night, putting on Trey Song's love. Okay? That's a whole nother part of that. I'll deal with that next week. But right? But what I'm saying to you, we're talking about love that encourages, love that builds you up, love that when you feel like giving up, it lifts you up and say, no, we're not going to stop. You got too much in you, too much purpose and destiny. See, that's deeper than a kiss. Smoochin can't bring that. 
When you look in my eyes and I can tell, when I look in your eyes, I see you believe in me when I don't believe in myself. When you can lift me up, when I'm giving you every reason to, to, to give up on me and I still see you believe in me. See, that's love. And what happened is, is, is you ain't going to be able to carry the mantle of the kingdom of God, Isaac, unless you find true love. And so we got to the point where, where Abraham had a servant that was like, look, we're going to find him a wife. And it's a whole long story of how he goes through to find this woman. And they end up coming upon Rebecca. And he ends up, and, and, and he ends up finding Rebecca. And watch what the scripture says. And Isaac brought her into his mother's tent, Sarah's tent, because Sarah was sick. And this is very key. Can I talk to the ladies right quick? It's important to know what a man's relationship with his mother is. Let me drink some water on that. <laughs> That's very key. Because it has everything to do with their interpretation of what they think a woman is. How a woman should be treated. And so on and so forth. And Isaac had heard the stories of the things that Sarah had walked through and lived through. She was every bit there with Abraham having to believe God for the impossible. And she was on her way to transitioning, passing away. And he was in need of making sure that he had a family stabilized so they can continue to carry the message of the kingdom to the next level. Abraham has to pass the baton to Isaac and he couldn't pass it unless he had a meaningful, stable foundation of love. To start with. And it was at that moment where Rebecca comes in and the Bible says that she comforted him after the mother's death. What's very key about love? What's very key about love is when people come into your life, the, the seasons that they come in. Sometimes, and let me help y'all who don't understand why certain folks in your life can't let go of certain people. You need to be, you need to find out when that person came into their life. Because that influences sometimes how their connection. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Because love, which goes brings to my second point. Go to the point, son. Watch this. The second point, when I say the four aspects of love, the first one was sacrifice. The second one is comfort. Somebody say comfort. <laughs> acts of affection and even acts of correction bring comfort when love is in it. That means that when love, see, you can have affection, right? But trust me, you live long enough, you're going to know the difference between lust and love. Okay? Lust says it's time to go. Love wants to come. <laughs> okay, that's the Right? Like <laughs> this. But love. Even acts of correction. That means when somebody has to check you or you have to check somebody for their behavior. When love is in it, it is even in correction and rebuke, I can still feel some level of comfort. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It's important that you recognize that if you don't feel a certain level, there's people we call friends, but when you get around them, you're totally uncomfortable. There's some people my wife knows who, who have a hard time knowing what a real friend is. I mean, the, per, the, per, the person in this, uh, this person's circle loves to pick, tell them how they need to lose weight, they need to do this. Every five minutes, they're trying to correct them. And they're spending time with this person and hanging out with them. I'm like, no wonder they have low self-esteem. Because that person is not building them up. That person is beating them down. There's no love in it. Amen. I mean, you know the difference between somebody saying, yo, you need to work out a little bit, say it's shake, uh, right? And somebody saying, mm. right? It's like, don't disrespect me, right? <laughs> you know the difference. You know when somebody's correcting you out of love and somebody just, can I say this? Sometimes we don't know. Because some of us been with the wrong kind of fake friends who tell you yes, yes, yes to everything. Mm -hmm. But probably talking behind you and laughing about you behind your back. You know them polka dots and stripes was and wood looking good. But she wants to make sure she look fly to you. Yes, it was up, right? If it's a real loving friendship, it's a real loving connection between you and family, if it's a real loving relationship, it should be a place you can run to for comfort. And sometimes 
Affection ain't the only level of comfort. Sometimes your comfort got to be in the fact that somebody's going to tell me when I'm wrong. The mistake we've made is to think that true comfort is when it's always loving W. You're so awesome. No, 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 no. Comfort is in saying you're better than that. How you acted, that's lower than the person you know yourself to be. See, that's what I'm talking about, right? I'm telling, being able to, to, to tell somebody that and you being able to receive it. See, that's real. there's comfort in knowing somebody's not going to watch you jump off the cliff being crazy. You got to have some people in your life who are willing to combat you. Because, you know, some of us, we make people fearful of di- disagreeing with us. Y'all ever have a friend in a circle? You know, if you disagree with them, you better put your body armor there on the day. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. And it don't matter what we're talking about. We could talk about a game. It don't matter a movie or who was a better actor. You know when you disagree with them, you better be suited up because they got to be right. And some of them will tell you that. Some of them crazy folks say, I'm going to tell you right now, you, you better bring all your information. You better, you're like, uh, we're talking about movies, y'all. <laughs> Look at your neighbor say, it has to have comfort in it. It has to have comfort in if it. If it's love. If it's love. Go to the next question. Genesis 25 and 28. We're dealing with Isaac, Esau, Rebekah, and Jacob. Um, And we're dealing with bias. It says, and the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did not eat. He did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. What's so crazy about this right here? This is Genesis 25, actually 27, 29. Isaac and Rebekah eventually have children. But Isaac loves Esau more than he loves Jacob. And Rebekah loves Jacob more than she loves Esau. Why? Because they represented them. See, Isaac loved Esau because Isaac... I mean, because Esau was like he was. He loved going out in the field, looking crazy, killing stuff, hunting, bringing stuff back. You know what I'm saying? He was on that tip. Jacob was like, no. Okay, got to get the manicure done. Right? I got to cook. Right? You know what's always amazing to me growing up? That, like, 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 I've seen some thugs that had to have their hair did. Like, this, like, like my West Coast thugs, most, mostly. You know what I mean? They got the, the nails done and the Jerry, their hair got to be done right. <laughs> but they a thug. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and don't get it twisted. They crazy now. <laughs> Just because they look pretty don't mean they ain't crazy. <laughs> don't mean it. Don't let it. Anyway, right? <laughs> but Isaac was on some because Esau reminded him of him. He saw himself in him. He loved him more. Rebecca, because her son could go in the kitchen and cook. He's like, that's my boy right there. And so, they, so it created conflict. Why is this important? Because love gives you preference and makes you biased and makes you less objective if you let it. And so what I mean to tell you is that sometimes we can't hear when people are trying to help us when it comes to people that we love. When people are trying to say, look, I'm not, watch this, isn't the, you ever go into a conversation like this, I'm not trying to break y'all up. <laughs> but they don't hear nothing you say after that. <laughs> I'm not taking y'all trying to break y'all up, but some things need to change. All they heard, break up. <laughs> Sometimes you try to go into it. In other words, love makes you so that you can't hear. You can't think objectively sometimes. All Isaac could see, like, yeah, Jacob, nice, but my son, he's so awesome. And what's crazy is, is that we don't always openly say that also because it reminds me of me, but that's what it is. I don't know about you. If you ever analyze family and see aunts, grandmothers, whatever, treat different family members different? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Let me tell you something. I'm going to be all, all the way real with you. I can remember hearing stories among my aunts and uncles about their grandparents and how, you know, they used to treat certain kids differently because they look certain ways. Can I walk in there, right? This one was high yellow so they could eat sausage and pancake. This one was dark skin. They had porridge, right? Some grits <laughs> with nothing, right? Matter of fact, I'll use a real, a real exact example. My uncles to the day, 
and my dad has passed on. Talk about how my grandpa- my great grandparents used to treat them differently because my, my my father could sing. He walk around the house singing. You know what I mean? And none of them none of them could sing at all, right? And she used to love to hear him. And so you know how old folks tell you when you go outside to play, don't come back inside. You can't all that going back in and out. Some of the old, older folks in here know what I'm talking about. You can go back in and out the house. You, know, you come back in here, you stay in here. And it's like, dog, I need some water. He said, water on the back porch. So this is the error. But what my father could do is he could come in the house and they'll send everybody. Like everybody would come in the house. Like, we told y'all not to go in the house, blah, blah, blah. And he'd be like, uh, Cupid, <laughs> Singing some Sam Cooke, right? And Grandma like, y'all get out of here. What'd you say? My dad's name was Joe, too. He said, Joe, come on here. They're like, why ain't y'all go outside? Y'all go outside. Ain't nothing wrong here. Because <laughs> they loved my dad's personality and the things that he could do. So they were biased. Love is dangerous because you can be biased. And it can make you unable to see the whole picture. And Isaac could not see that every time he showed love to Esau, he showed Jacob he wasn't good enough. Every time, and that's daddy, remember now, this is the father. You want to make your father proud, but I know that dad is not proud of me like he is Esau. But look at the flip side. Every time Rebecca showed love to Jacob, she showed Esau he wasn't good enough. Mothers give you nurturing. So what did she do? Make him harder. Because father was the only one that validated him. So where Jacob got a certain level of sensitivity, Esau did not. And where Esau got a certain level of hardness, Jacob did not. Are y'all following what I'm saying? That's to show you, you got to ask yourself, am I being balanced when I'm demonstrating love? Can I help y'all out right quick? How about some of us in relationships, but you got friends? (laughs) And them friends like, I know you got somebody, but are we ever going to hang out? Ever, ever? Forever, ever? (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we don't realize that when we when we do acts of love, what have you communicated to other people that are watching? By either your actions or inactions. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It says here, and Jacob saw pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And what's sad about this is that Jacob, as much as his mother loved him, it couldn't replace. You could only get your birthright from one parent, and that's from daddy. So even though mom loved him, he had to get the birthright. And mom conspires with Jacob to steal the birthright from Esau. Had Jacob dress up because Isaac got old and his eyes was faint. And and whenever people talked to him, he was laying on the side of the bed. He would put his his hand on their arm so he could tell who he was talking to. So mama hooks him up because Esau was on some hairy stuff. okay? because he worked out in the field. You know what I'm saying? Didn't always shave. Right. And so she gets some she gets some animal hair. Have Jacob glue it on his arm and all of this, you know, put some, have him smelling like Esau and go in the room and say, daddy, it's me. And he's like, it don't sound like you. (laughs) And Isaac puts his arm, his hand on Esau's arm and he, I mean, on Jacob's arm, but he thinks it's Esau because mama done dressed it up. And he get, he, he says, I bless you. And he blessed him with the birthright. And he, and when Esau comes in to be blessed, he's like, I have no more blessing left. Because back then your birthright was your words. And once you said you was going to do one thing, you couldn't take it back. And once he said, he told, even though it was a trick, the fact that he blessed Jacob, he could not give him his birthright back. And so in other words, sometimes the way we love or the way we fail to love, you can cause parties that don't have beef with each other to begin to fight. Can I help somebody in here today? I'm talking about those of you who, who are juggling friendships Family relationships and 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 and, uh, and real uh, and, and other relationships, are you causing division because you're not being balanced in how way you communicate and the way you demonstrate your love? I'm trying to help somebody today. Go to the next. My third point: love is not only about sacrifice. Love is not only about um, what was the second? 
Comfort, right? But somebody say validation. How we love others validates them. But who we choose to love validates what we believe about ourselves. What do I mean by that? Because sometimes who we choose to be with tells more about what we think about us. Oh, can I help somebody today? Because see, we, we want to get with such and such. Because if I get with such and such, then it's going to be. Can I can I talk can I talk about can I talk to the fellas right quick? Now you know, fellas, it takes us a while to get high minded on relationship today, because we're taught all day, yo, got to get the flyest girl in the room, right? That's just the way it is. Because you taught, and she the flyest, she mine. Uh, and so there's a status. Where I'm a gift with her because everybody else thinks she's the bomb. And I do too. So I gotta let everybody know that I'm the ultimate bomb because I got with the ultimate bomb girl, right? I'm the best. So, in other words, I'm giving you a very elementary example of this, obviously. But what I'm saying to you, it had everything to do with you think that this is gonna produce a certain reputation for you. And it had very little to do with who that person actually is. Can I help somebody? Sometimes you'll realize in life that there's people, you ever be in a situation where you didn't realize people thought very highly of you? Like, not, not, not to say that you had low self-esteem, or not to say that you thought bad of yourself, but sometimes you don't always comprehend where other people's perceptions are. And sometimes you can stumble upon a situation where people get with you for the wrong reasons. Because you belong to such and such an organization, such and such a group. Or you make a such and such amount of money, or you got your people know you for such and such, and you realize that you are a status symbol for somebody, not a relationship. And then sometimes we need to admit when that's what we're doing. Because let's be honest, sometimes when you come out of a bad relationship, you ain't always looking for love like you should. Because in your world, love doesn't hurt you. So you're like, I gotta get something that is gonna make me feel good. <laughs> And so you end up making choices that's based upon a status of how you want to feel and not based upon a real connection. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. Somebody say, the rebound phase. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Man. When you're in the rebound stage, you hurt people. Can I help somebody? I'm going to walk slow. When you're in the rebound stage, you make people become a rest stop for you. And they're not the destination. Only problem is you don't tell them that. They're like, you arrived. They don't realize you're only here for... <laughs> Next week. <laughs> but who we choose to love validates. Love is powerful because it validates you. Sometimes we choose people based upon what we want to believe about ourselves. So you got to ask yourself, what, what is... Because here's, here's what's dangerous. If you've been having some really bad uh, analysis of you and not being really true to you, then you could be getting with people because you're trying to cover up something. And so instead of them being a relationship, they're really just a cover for what you really got going on. And I've seen people do it. Get in relationships to protect us part of themselves they don't want to deal with. And sometimes we date people who purpose, we purposely you know, won't ask certain questions or not privy or they have not discerned certain things you're going through. And so they end up being your safe bet. The problem is how long are you going to drag them along before you make them realize that you got unresolved issues? Go to the next. Watch this here. Man, that's small. <laughs> My last scripture was today. And Jacob and Jacob came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee. Look at this nigga and say, Jacob could cook now. <laughs> With the same red pole, for I am faint thereof, was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. So, in other words, Esau comes in from the field doing what his father loves. He comes in, and what is Jacob doing? He's whipping it up in the kitchen. He's like, You want some of this red pot? Son, you notice what you like. <laughs> and so, homeboy, like, Yeah, I'm hungry. Come on, make it happen. And so Jacob, being on, the, being on the scheme that he's on, that he divides with his mom, is still wanting his daddy's approval because daddy don't think he's as strong as Esau. He said, sell me your birthright. And watch this here. This is interesting. And Esau said, behold, 
I am at the point to die. And what profit shall his birthright, shall this birthright do to me? Now look at your neighbor say, he really wasn't about to die. <laughs> look at your neighbor say, don't ever make, don't ever make a, permanent decision a permanent decision off of a temporary circumstance. <laughs> This is why you can't, the Bible says be slow to speak and swift to hear. Because sometimes we say stuff in the moment that you should have kept your mouth closed. And sometimes we make decisions that you should have waited a while. You should have waited until the, that cloud over your head passed. See, sometimes you need to pause for a moment and process information. Because what that happened here is that he wasn't really about to die, but he exaggerated the situation. He look at that. He was in his emotions. He was in his emotions. Look at that. He was like Drake. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You got the one here, don't you? In other words, don't be don't be fooled. Men are emotional too. We just show it differently. They're punching the wall. That's real wise and intelligent, right? I was mad. Okay. There's other ways. <laughs> the bottom line is, he exaggerates the point in his mind saying, I'm at the point to die. And basically, he said, this birthright ain't doing nothing for me right now. And here's what I'm trying to get you to see. Is that he sacrificed something that was due him because he wasn't satisfied at the moment. And at the moment, he had a, he, he was hungry for instant gratification. And that was that food. Look at your neighbor and say, what is it? What is it? That you're settling for right now. That you're settling for right but now. But you know in your heart. But you know in your heart. It can't last. It can't last. This is serious. You about to give up your birthright so you can eat a meal? But I always say it's easy for preachers to pick on people in the Bible until you look at your life and say, there's some things that I've been acting funny with and funny about, and I've been saying and doing some things toward that I need to change how I feel. And what happens here? It says here, then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In other words, he sold his birthright. But after the morning, look at the name of the morning. He realized he had done a wrong thing. And my question to you is, don't allow situations that won't last forever to shape and shift the decisions you make regarding love. And you end up losing something. That actually was due you. Amen. See birthright was what he was. God had already set it up for it to be with him. But because of his his temporary situation, he decided to get in his emotions, get in his flesh because he was he had he had a hunger for something else. He had a hunger to be gratified now and he threw his future away for the present. And it becomes dangerous. My last point. The people in our lives that we love often represent the appetite we have or had at a particular time. See, think about it. Esau in his right mind would not have gotten rid of his birthright. But at the time, his appetite cried out for that red pottage. My question to you is, is there an appetite that you have right now that could possibly be leading you in the wrong direction? Because if it costs you to sacrifice what God has already promised you, then it's something that you need to leave alone. Are y'all hearing me today? The reason why love is so powerful is because love requires a sacrifice. Love is about comfort. And love is all about you being validated. But lastly, look at your neighbor and say, don't be too thirsty. Don't be too thirsty. That's a statement that people say nowadays. And what is alluding to is that don't be in a desperate situation where you make a decision that changes the direction of your life. Because you're trying to get satisfied right now. Everybody stand to their feet.